Hello, good evening, and happy Friday. We are coming to you live with episode four of our weekly album discussion streams. I've got a little bit of inside baseball for y'all. We are potentially going to be a little more drunk off the top of this stream than we are at the end of it. Uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second here. But first off, I'm Matt, and tonight I am joined by Cam. Good evening. And we've got Brad with us once again. Brad. Hello. Nice to be here. Together, we are a ballpark music, and every week we pick an album that came out on a Friday, give ourselves a week with it, then come back together on a stream for an in-depth discussion. No scoring, no taste making. Music is not sports. If you like what you see, give us a follow on the socials and we'll let you know when we're going live. Uh, guys, I'm getting a sense of deja vu. I don't know about you. Uh, no, I'm actually just getting a dawning realization that we're called Ballpark Music and we have a tagline for this particular stream that says music is not sports. So you said that <laughs> you said that episode one. We've discussed taglines and that never came up. But as soon as you said music is not sports, it's like, okay, yeah, no, we're keeping that for sure. Um, look, I've already just made that connection just now. So this is actually, um, this is the uh, second time that we've uh, recorded this intro tonight. Um, we had some issues with our stream uh, that went up earlier. Uh, we had a fantastic discussion of the album that we're going to be talking to you all about tonight. Um, and then as soon as we got off, we patted each other on the backs, went very good, very good, very good. Uh, opened up the capture that we took of it. Uh, we're using OBS Streamlabs, as many people do, uh, to both record and stream this. Um, and it was missing probably the first half hour or so of the stream. Um, it basically cuts in right around track two of our album discussion. So we had so much fun doing it. We did say... And you'll see when we get to the end of this video as well. This is the fun thing. We know what happens at the end of this video already, uh, even though we are ostensibly live. Um, we did say at the end of this video that we enjoyed the album and we wouldn't mind talking about it again. So we thought, why not just jump back on and record it again? Um, you're going to see a little bit of a change. You're going to see a little bit of an edit, uh, probably around that track two, track three mark. Bonus points if you get to pick out what happens and you can see things moving around. Uh, for example, let's talk about what we're drinking tonight. Um, you're going to see this beautiful bottle of Budweiser replaced with a can of White Claw just out of nowhere. Uh, Cam, what are you drinking tonight? Uh, nothing, because I have nothing left to drink. <laughs> it's all gone. <laughs> I have some water. Ooh, very nice, very nice. Brad, what have you got on? <clears throat> I obviously thought ahead because I'm still drinking the classic punk IPA. Oh, why didn't I grab the anti-establishment IPA? We talked about this. I've been given a second chance and I've still fucked it up. I've still fucked it up. Um, hey, well, look, uh, I tell you what, seeing as this is a little Easter egg treat, why don't we just kick ourselves straight into the album discussion tonight? Um, and uh, we've got... Nice bits of discussion that we can keep for next week. Um, but yeah, so uh, it, this week we are talking about Dry Cleaning's debut album, New Long Leg. Uh, looking at the press blurb like we do every week, uh, this was released by 4AD Records, who are London-based. Dry Cleaning, the South London group of Nick Buxton on drums, Tom Douse with the guitars, Lewis Maynard on bass, and Florence Shaw on vocals, released their debut album, New Long Leg, on the 2nd of April, so this time last week. The 10-track long player, which includes Strong Feelings and last year's single, Scratch Card Lanyard, was recorded over two weeks last summer at Rockfield Studios in rural Wales, with producer John Parrish, who's previously worked on PJ Harvey and Aldous Harding records, following on from their thrillingly taught 2019 EPs, Boundary Road Snacks and Drinks and Sweet Princess, 
New Long Leg is more ambitious and complex, with Shaw's spoken vocals tightly intertwined with the band's restless instrumentals. With the lyrics preoccupied by themes like disassociation, escapism, daydreaming, complicated feelings of love, anger, revenge, anxiety, the kitchen, lethargy, forgetfulness, and survival, Shaw says, quote, the title is ambiguous. A new long leg could be an expensive present or a growth or a table repair. So guys, last week, um, we ummed and odd about how best to categorize Citizen musically. Um, it'd probably be a safe bet to say that dry cleaning are captured by that broad strokes post-punk movement that's pretty prevalent at the minute. But without a doubt, this band gives off a very unique vibe. Um, Cam, you suggested that we take a look at this album this week. What attracted you to it? Uh, this is the point where I get to rehash my fan theory. <laughs> um, the, I initially saw the band named Dry Cleaning, um, and that was pretty much what attracted to me. I love an unusual band name. I love a band that takes something very ordinary and calls it you know, Dry Cleaning. Where does that kind of come from? My, my theory is that it comes um, from being a fan of Sonic Youth's music, um, who they famously almost named themselves Washing Machine halfway through their career. Um, and maybe it's a little callback to that, but maybe not. Um, but that's kind of what I was thinking when I, when I first saw the name. Um, and was not disappointed because there's obvious sort of Sonic Youth references throughout their music, um, as well as other sort of post-punk low-wave bands of the era. And Brad, presented with dry cleaning, what did you think? Did you have any knowledge of them before going in? No, they're not a band I'd heard of before. Um, and I'm not a huge follower of the genre in general, so it was a bit of a kind of blank slate for me, I think. Um, nice to kind of challenge what I would normally listen to. And this one definitely threw me a few surprises. No doubt, no doubt. So let's get into the track by track here. Um, we start off with Scratch Card Lanyard. Um, I think it's a really good uh, introduction to the album in the sense that it gives you a great idea of what to expect, right? You're introduced to Florence's vocal style straight off the bat, and that permeates throughout the record. Um, Brad, how would you describe her vocal style, right? It's kind of, it's kind of a deadpan delivery. It's you know very flat, um, kind of very I'd say down to earth. I think it would be very easy to overdo it and kind of force it. It never feels like that. Um, it feels like it comes very naturally. It doesn't feel forced. It feels really charming. Um, just throughout, really. It's um you know it's it, it it's spoken esque right you know we we aren't dealing with lots of notes here, um you you could level an accusation of it being monotone I suppose but um it's it the first time that you listen through this album you get to this track and you wonder is this the style that we're going to be carrying on through the entire thing with. Um, and, uh, you know, absolutely. This is 100% what you're, what you're, uh, what you're going to be graced with, uh, for the rest of your listening. And, you know, um, there, there's, there's a, a very British, I think, nature to it, right? You know, it is dripping in what, uh, people who grew up on my side of the ocean, uh, would say, you know, is that very British charisma there. I think there's that, but there's also sort of a long lineage of um, influence that you can sort of draw back throughout the ages. Obviously, we talked Sonic Youth straight from the start. There's a there's an obvious kind of connection that you can immediately make to a Kim Gordon style vocal, especially on a song like, but you know, uh, Bull in the Heather, something like that, where there's that kind of spoken word, very cool, very kind of dry witness to it, but then. You know, you take that back further to their influences and you get sort of to the beat poet kind of generation and that kind of comes through on this as well. And then you go forward and you can hear bands like Orp or 
you know, I'll talk about them later, but Porridge Radio to a degree with that deadpan monotone vocal styling. So you can kind of hear that there is a Britishness to it, but also that it is very influenced by these very non-British cultural phenomena. I think I meant maybe, maybe less so in the style, more her delivery of it. Oh, yeah. By, you yeah. know, very much picking up on the accent there. It, it, it's interesting. Um, I mean, you've mentioned Sonic Youth and... Um, uh, one thing that is great about this album throughout is is the writing. Um, I fell in love with it uh, pretty much as soon as I heard this first song. Um, but, you know, just going uh, off that Sonic Youth point, I, I can't for the life of me remember where I read it now. Um, but when I was doing some research on this band uh, ahead of this stream, um, there was an article that mentioned, you know, they, they have been perhaps some fairly lumped um, or termed as a Sonic Youth ripoff um, uh, throughout their development. And um, that same article mused that one of my favorite bits of writing on this track, um, it's a Tokyo bouncy ball, it's an Oslo bouncy ball, it's a Rio de Janeiro bouncy ball, is a reaction to just that critique, right? Uh, wherever it comes from, no matter what it is, if it's fun, it's fun. And you just judge it at that. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're dealing with deep bouncy ball imagery on this track. Well, there's there's two, th two schools of thought on it. One, you can hear the influence. That, that, that's definitely there and there's no denying that. But to call them a, a Sonic Youth ripoff or just lump them as that is really lazy because they are definitely their own thing. They're bringing their own vibe to it. They have their own influences aside from Sonic Youth. It's just that when you're operating in this genre... It's such an easy, you know, they were the first to really do it. They're probably the biggest band to, you know, operate in this field, or were, sorry, the biggest band to operate in this field, and were the innovators of this kind of music in a lot of ways for a lot of people. So it's, it's, it's lazy, I feel, to do that. Um, and I'll, I'll do it several times tonight, but it is, it is quite a lazy sort of throwback to it. Um, you can see it all throughout with the guitar work, you can go back to it with the sort of surrealist lyrics you can go to it but it still sounds like its own thing like for example um you know i think of myself as a hardy banana is one of the opening lyrics in this song now i couldn't see sonic youth ever writing something like that 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 lyric itself it, it's definitely got its own identity it's definitely dry cleanings um but you can see oh maybe we're influenced by the surrealism of that kind of thing so you've mentioned a little bit about, you know, the guitar work there. Um, was was there anything that stood out to us musically on, stra <laughs> excuse me, Scratch Card Lanyard? <laughs> I mean, straight away, you're in with, like, that kind of classic punk bass line. Um, <clears throat> really strong kind of start here. Um, the drums coming through. There's something kind of like very pleasing about the sound on the drums especially on this first track i noticed it sounds kind of squelchy is the best way i can use best way i can describe it um <clears throat> yeah there's some like nice percussion going on some nice panning within that um the guitar tone on this is just really great i think it's like it's not too controlled it's fairly raw it's just a really great sounding clean um some really creative use of delays throughout as well and like the big jangly kind of chords that you'd come to expect. Yeah, and I think underneath all that, you've got this this driving bass, which is going to be a theme throughout this album. Um, and I think without that and the, the really tight rhythm section that we have going on here, you're going to kind of... This, this could be in danger of being meddling and being quite tiresome after one song, but because that's there and it's all working in this kind of glorious combination, it just becomes such a, a fun listen right off the bat, straight away, straight into it and straight into that groove. Um, you know, in in terms of something, you know, you said could be tiresome. I mean, you know, one thing that I never get tired of throughout this album is, is as I've said already, the, the writing, the imagery that's at play. I think it's used so effectively in uh, Scratch Card Lanyard because, you know, um, at times, yes, you know, it feels like a real stream of consciousness, 
but it's never unfocused and you know just for the sake of it e each word con is feels considered and um carries some meaning um and you know for something that i think if you're being unkind you could describe as arty it remains immensely relatable throughout you know there there's so many lyrics that are like oh yeah i get that and, and scratch card lanyard pulls you into the album with a few of those um i could pick out a number but like damn do i feel it'll be okay i just need to be weird and hide for a bit and eat an old sandwich from my bag um you know definitely definitely been there and i i i could talk for hours about the imagery on this i i i spoiler alert now knowing what i know we'll go on to talk for a fair old time about the imagery on this album um and you know considering we're on the opening track and still haven't mentioned uh twixes and women in aviators with bazookas um yeah i i i, I think that goes to show um how much there is for us to go off of and it's just one other thing i want to bring up at this point um it's the line do everything and feel nothing it's quite a common um post punk maybe art rock uh trope to have this kind of repetitive mm. kind of line coming throughout and throughout and throughout and throughout but it doesn't feel stale here um it feels very in place very very focused um the, the there's this big song last year from a band called fontaine's dc that i think of um that they had the same sort of thing where it's life life ain't always empty um, and you'd think after hearing that 50 times in a row, you'd get kind of tired and it would be stale, but it's the same sort of vibe where it just builds that intensity of the track and it's that little lift from the kind of repetitive nature that's happening with the music. Yeah, as soon as you've said that, I've had a bunch of you know, Fontaine's DC songs come to mind and um, Murder Capital in there as well. Mm. They do something very similar. Um, so yeah, you know, it's it, it's a full frontal assault um i think you know um off the top there but when we move on to track two on smart lady we simplify a little bit here um we're welcomed with a fat guitar riff um and some shorter lyrical phrases and delivery uh cam what are, what are you thinking here thinking straight off the bat great chaotic guitar work um it's, you know it's grooving and there's the bass again the drums ticking the whole thing along but again, the bass is really the core of the music for me, and the guitar is just kind of floating around on top. And my, my one big takeaway from this song, um, aside from lyrical themes, which are quite uh, quite pertinent on this track, is just how catchy this album is for something that doesn't really have hooks, doesn't have any kind of big melodies, big choruses, or whatever. It's, it's so catchy and hypnotic throughout. Yeah, I mean, it's the rhythm section again. Like we've mentioned, it's that driving bass kind of propelling it. This is a slightly more relaxed feel <clears throat> on this one. It's a bit looser. Um, the drums feel like they're a bit more stripped back to me. Um, I think we start to get a bit more dissonance kind of peeking through in this track as well. Um, some of the, like the noise elements coming through. We've got some great like kind of distorted slides running through it. Um, a bois solo that kind of bridges on kind of diatonic and get, then going a bit outside. Um, even there's like this cool kind of like doomy sounding rundown that comes through the track as well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the music on this one is kind of what we're getting familiar with, but it develops after this again, like even so much more. So, you know, uh, it's what you guys are i think describing here is is something that i noticed more on subsequent listens um to the album right you know the first uh go through that you have of uh all of these tracks you know you are very focused in on the vocals because it's that you know slightly different method of delivery you're very focused in on the lyrical content as well because you know it's painting this vast tapestry um but if you 
stop listening to that a little bit you really get drawn into the music and notice that you know this isn't just an accompaniment this isn't just something that we are you know having for um, Florence to talk over or anything like that um, it, it's it full of some really unique turns and uh, on on smart lady I mean I really started to melt away into the music on this track um, it, it's given its place to shine and it it, you become aware right away that if you become too engrossed uh, in the poetry being woven, you, you far too easily dis um, dismiss uh, the accompanying music. Um, it's got a very psychedelic kind of groovy vibe to it as well, um, I think. And that, that's something that you see throughout the album. I, I could lay down on some comfy carpet and stare at the ceiling quite happily with this album on. Um, uh, and, you know, certainly I think some of the lyrical elements are, are still there, too. Um, uh, there's a few places on the album where Florence evokes strong women, and this track is no different. You know, ultimately, if you like a girl, be nice. It's not rocket science is a message I think we can all get on board with, right? And we can all live by, definitely. <laughs> Quite right. Quite right. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I think one thing for sure um, uh, that comes out instrumentally on this track is some lovely, clean bass. Flashback. Um, as we uh, move on to track three, we're, we're welcomed uh, by that bass uh, at the opening here. Uh, have you got strong feelings about strong feelings, Brad? Um, I've got a question about strong feelings. Okay. What do you think an emo dead stuff collector is? <laughs> I, I, is it is it her you know i i i think um you know if you're listening into the lyrics on um a lot of these tracks here you know it it, it could be uh construed as quite emo um so you know i i i i, I didn't know if that was you know just a a, a very blank and very personal comment there <laughs> I, I will caveat what i'm about to say with it's i'm not an art man and i didn't first make this realization i know nothing about art i'm a luddite when it comes to that kind of thing i complained the whole time while i got dragged around the caravaggio exhibit in napoli <laughs> but what was pointed out to me and i kind of realized and made the connection with afterwards is that there's a lot of kind of art mentioned throughout this um and kind of the, the obscurity and the references could be related to like certain obscure types of art. I think pointillism was mentioned where you can't quite see exactly what's happening with those an everyday occurrence. And you get that in lyrics such as, you know, in the paintings foreground at the bottom is a famous anamorphic, which when viewed side long is revealed to be a human skull. So I had to read that because it's quite a difficult sentence to get out. But you kind of, you understand a lot of the words in that sentence, but you have absolutely no idea what it means. And I, and I feel like the emo dead stuff collector could be a, another thing. That, you know you know what emo is, you know what dead is, you know what a stuff collector is, but what do these things mean together? Um, it, again, it goes back to that, that beat poet vibe, where you just kind of that surrealist vibe. Um, it, it's it's really difficult with a with a, with a lyrical set like this to know whether you're really stupid, and the person writing is really clever, or it's deliberately obscure to the point of frustration where you're never going to be able to understand it unless you wrote it because they'll have some very niche experience they had, um, and it's, it's just absolutely incredible for that because you sit there and you're like. What does that mean? I have no idea what that means. And Brad asked the question, what is an emo dead stuff collector? And here we are all having this conversation around it. And we're probably not even close, not even hitting close to the mark. Well, we've, we've had a contribution from chat. Uh, this is Water again. Thanks for chiming in. Uh, it says uh, it's, it's someone who hangs on to the ugly slash bad slash negative memories was my reading. Um, so I, I think that's... Uh, again, another um, uh, uh, another thought on that. I mean, we we've gotten wrapped up in this, but you know, again, this this song contains possibly the most relatable line on the whole album for me. I've been thinking about eating that hot dog for hours. I've definitely had those days. Um, you know, this is another great example of a track when the delivery of the vocals sticks 
you know, with that same tone throughout the whole album. Um, but, you know, of how the music can really help lift up um, uh, and add emphasis effectively. Um, I'm thinking particularly about the bits of guitar that come through at the start of now, I want to say it's the choruses, but it might also be the verses. And with each listen, I was less sure about the structure, I guess. But, you know, I really enjoy that about this song. Really enjoy that about this song. It's reassuring to, um, you know, see, see some um, alternative takes on uh, uh, musical structure out there um, and making waves. <coughs> Yeah, I don't think you could say this is a typical tropey pop structure by <laughs> any stretch of the imagination. Um, but yeah, like you say, the guitar lines, there's some really nice stuff coming through. Um, you've got that bass kind of drifting between the, the G and E minor. Um, and you've got the guitar lines like starting to peek through. It sounds quite eerie at first when it first comes in, but it's all chord tones. It's all like consonant, diatonic like stuff. Um, and it just kind of builds. I think the lead in this builds really nicely um, into like a really melodic piece. Um, like other stuff that comes in in this track, you've got some Shaker. I always love Shaker. I'm a big fan <laughs> of Shaker. And you get, kind of get some nice pads coming through as well in there. Um, and I don't know if this is the bit you were talking about as the chorus where the, the guitar starts playing the chords, Matt. Yes. Yeah, that's Rather right. than the lead lines. Yeah, you've yeah, got yeah. that kind of it's like that D7 part over over the G bass is kind of relentlessly sticking with that G. Um, yeah, again, like the nice kind of spangly sounding guitar chords, beautiful in that clean tone. Um, and some sneaky crashes coming in on the two in here as well throughout, which just like kind of takes you off guard, makes you like your ears prick up a bit and go, oh, <laughs> it's different. There is so much subtlety in, in the songs where you'll get things like that, where you get the crash on the two, um, which just, just lifts it. Because at this point you think, okay, this is the third song of this album now. We've had the driving groove and bass. We've had the very consistent steady drums. Had this deadpan vocal for three songs now. And this kind of very, the guitar changes throughout, but obviously it's still within that style. And you're kind of like, on other records, you'd maybe be a bit like, well, you know, I've heard the same three songs three times now, but it never feels stale because of those little moments that are thrown in there, and possibly because you're so sort of drawn in by all this imagery that we've been talking about. Uh, it, I just find that really amazing about this record. Um, I think... No, go ahead, please. I think, yeah, I was just going to say, I think it's like, it's great how they managed to like make such a flesh out of thing out of so little, like, the arrangement sounds big, the arrangement sounds huge, but it's not like when you break it down into its constituent parts, there aren't that many. Like you've got drums, bass, guitar at the core of it. Um, a classic setup for this kind of thing, yes. But I think it's elevated by like the kind of progression in the guitar parts and the choice of, you know, odd bits of harmony. Um but yeah, just they're doing a lot with a little, I feel, here. Like a lot of song with a few instruments. And, and only one guitar player as well. You know, you think some bands in this genre and sort of when you branch off into the more psychedelic thing, I'm thinking King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. <laughs> Try is. saying that three times. You know, you, they have three guitar players. And albeit it's a different thing because they've, they've got their whole microtonal guitar thing going on and um, it's a different type of psychedelic. And, but there's so many often guitar players in this and they just have one and you never feel like you need another guitar player in this band at any point i don't feel anyway it it would be something i think you know incredible to see live in that regard um you know because there there are a lot of um you know different dissident dissonant guitar parts um i think you know appearing throughout this album um and uh yeah no as you say hadn't, hadn't maybe quite appreciated until i read that blurb out that you know it was just uh you know the single guitar player there i just want to say i think we're uh, having a competition who can get the most tongue tied tonight <laughs> <laughs> brad go on it's your go <laughs> i think i think dissident guitar parts works as well as dissonant guitar parts to be fair i think well, they both sure. kind of apply here um 
<laughs> shit. You're going to make me pick between the two uh, when I clearly only meant one of them. And now I'm not sure which one it was. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to move on to uh, Leafy. Um, I think that's the safest thing to do. Um, you know, this is uh, probably the song that I have uh, thought about the most um, off of this album. You know, again, you've got some real relatable mundanities that are laid out on this track lyrically. Um, an exhausting walk in the horrible countryside, a tiresome swim in a pointless bit of sea, knackering drinks with close friends, uh, you know, things that at their core we as humans are meant to enjoy that sometimes in those mo moments you do feel just that or, you know, um, Perhaps in the case of the last one, it, it's something that you think about, you know, before you go out with friends pre-pandemic pre and you go like, oh, God, effort. Um, you know, all delivered in that same monotone that we're used to, but the music excites and takes what could be quite a dry song in other contexts to one that I think is a lot of fun and not just thanks to the llama plushies. Um, Cam, what did you think of it? Uh, I just like a different take actually lyrically, which is probably should be expected by now. But I actually thought this was kind of maybe looking back on a relationship that a lot of the lyrics in the song. And the reason I think that is because there's the line, never talk about your ex, never, 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 never slag them off because they know, then they know. Which I thought was an incredible line anyway, um, just on, on a standalone thing. But then it made me think about these kind of like horrible country walks that you'd be going on and and I, I thought maybe that you'd be looking back on something like that where you'd go and do these things as a couple that you maybe wouldn't necessarily do on your own um i certainly drag janet snake on a lot of country walks and we'll have done i think she enjoys them but you don't know sort of thing so um i think it could be looking back at things like that and that was my initial interpretation of them so um yeah I think it's really interesting that you've you've taken that line to springboard off for like you know the overall meaning for the song because I took another one um, that comes after that. Um, it's the mentions of having to take these pills, and you know again, um, we may both be right here because going back to that press blurb, it did say lyrically it dealt with you know a lot about relationships, but it also um, dealt with uh, uh, disassociation, right? And you know I think again. Those are um, some very uh, relatable or classic kind of, you know, symptoms of that, having those events like that by, you know, going out and just thinking oh, it's the horrible countryside, don't want to be here or anything like that, pointless bit of sea, stuff like that. So um, I, I, I springboarded off of that lyric. You springboarded off of a different one. It might be both. But equally, you could take that next lyric as, you know, uh, a, a thing about the contraceptive pill and, and that ambiguity is is just at the core of everything here we could go in forever with about 10 different theories to every single different line on this album it's just so cleverly written um it feels kind of effortless as well mm. like not it didn't take a lot to, I, well, I don't i don't want to say that because i might have poured the heart and soul into writing the lyrics but you know what i mean it feels like it comes very naturally um and it's so stream of conscious that it's just like the thoughts but it, it just absolutely sort of mesmerizing in that way mesmerizing. i think that's part of what makes it so relatable though i think i don't think anyone could listen to these songs and not find a single thing in them that kind of resonates with them in some way even if it's i've been thinking about eating that hot dog for hours now you know even if it's even if that's the line that really sings to you there will be like things in there you reson that resonate with you like okay. tires and drinks with friends or long horrible walks in the countryside you know yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna save the line that resonated most with me until later because hasn't appeared yet <laughs> look forward to that look forward to that um yeah you know as you say i think we can get caught up in a lot of the uh the meaning to these lyrics here um did it, anybody have anything to pick out sonically um on uh on leafy I think it's quite consistent with what we've heard before. You've still got that that huge bass and a very tight rhythm section, um, and and at this point, because you're you're so used to those and they're still really great, they're still really trance like you're having this trance like effect on you. I don't know if you've ever seen an artist like this live, um, but it's it's one of those where you'll be sort of forty five minutes into the show and not actually realize where you are. You you'll just have zoned off and be 
And in fact, I know you have seen this live because it's that kind of thirst and more experience <laughs> where you see God and you, you have a whole conversation with, you know, the planets and all that kind of stuff while you're listening to this music. But it's it's not like it's not psychedelic. It's just very sort of um, trancey, just enter this world. And, and the, the music being so consistent throughout, again, it's post-punk, but it, it just it does that to you. Um, so there's not a great deal to say that's different. I I didn't hear anyway. Brad might tell you differently, but it it just continues that kind of a legacy from the first couple of tracks on the album. Yeah, the bass part is very similar to the previous track. It kind of feels like a progression of that. Um, again, you've got some pads coming through. I think you have like a more electric drum sound coming through on this one, which is like catches your ear a little bit here. Um, I think there's some really nice interplay between the bass and the lead guitar on this one. Um, this is where I noticed it the most, anyway. Um, again, the evolving lead lines kind of progressing throughout the songs. Um, but I think the end is the bit that caught my attention most. You know, you dropped a bass on its own. <laughs> the bass is there, and the bass drops, and the drums come back in, and it just finishes on drums. So I was like, huh, okay, that's yeah. a new ending. <laughs> Very nice, very nice. And um, uh, that takes us through to her hippo. Um, you know, Cam, again, I think you're probably the right person for me to check with on this. Was I right to get some Pixies vibes from the music on her hippo? Close, okay. close. Okay, I'm learning. This straight up reminded me of The Cure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see straight that. Straight I got, I got such, like, heavy Cure vibes. Um especially uh you know kind of not just sort of boys don't cry or anything like that but the kind of um work other work that they've done um driving someone else's train that kind of that kind of sound for example um yeah that that was the the biggest thing i, I can see where the pixies would come into it but it's it's that kind of you know pixies are known for having that kind of soft loud dynamic but this is got kind of that tone and that clean guitar sort of thing um so it doesn't really have that song structure um but it has that that vibe um yeah the drums are slightly softer here too i found i thought they were they were slightly pulled back maybe in the mix a little bit i don't know if anyone else heard that at all but it, it definitely felt like they were they were pulled back and it, a, lot of, a lot more space was given to the guitar and the bass to have something to play here um it's, it's almost imperceptible but when you listen to the album back to back kind of five times in a row like i did yesterday <laughs> you kind of like get to get to like really notice that um because it's it's it stands out in the kind of i don't want to say monotonous but like that kind of trance like thing that's happening there there's little tiny imperceptible changes um you know track by track really start to add up at points like this um yeah that that's that's what i thought musically <laughs> It might have just been, yeah, I think the bright, sparkly acoustic guitars, um, I think, that sent me down that path. But, yeah, you know, the instruments build wonderfully on this track. Um, it, it starts off pretty fast, but, you know, the tempo only picks up when you really get to the final verse. Um, and I think that does a fantastic job of helping out the storytelling on this. Um I noted that this track was ostensibly about um, escape fantasies. And again, the music does help paint that picture so well. Um, you know, Florence goes uh, from a trapped person screaming with the feeling of bees legs on her face through, you know, in the final verse to an airport surrounded by idiots in trousers. Um, as, and that's the point where the track really starts to pick up. If you weren't directed to the lyrical callback to how she doesn't deal well with heat from the start of the song um, in preparation for that hot, you would still be sure, I think, from the music alone that, you know, the, the escape fantasy is becoming a reality that isn't as smooth sailing as expected um, just purely through those, you know, distracting strain nature of the guitars. Yeah, you're kind of back to it. I feel like it's less of a relaxed feel in this song in general. The last two have been kind of slightly more laid back in comparison. Um, this one's more on the beat. It's more like you've got more of a push to it again. Um, yeah, like you said, those guitar parts really do like build and evolve towards the end really nicely into like some kind of the 
it's, it's just adding energy, I think, as it goes. Um, adding to that kind of escape fantasy. Um, yeah, and my favorite line on the album, <laughs> more espresso, less depresso. I mean, come on. <laughs> I, I, I can't believe that's the line that stood out to you on this song. And there's a line that goes, an electrician stuck his finger in the plug hole and shouted, Yabba. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because but... I got lost on that. Like, I have not got any interpretation for the lyrics of this song because I was so lost on that line for such a long time. Like, I... I what does that mean? <laughs> what are you, what's, what's happening here? And you get so, so lost in little moments like that that um, you, you just kind of... You tend to forget other time other things are happening. I just actually want to throw out a question because it's something I noticed maybe earlier in the album, but definitely by this point, is that I, I don't hear it so often these days. But it's such a well mixed album as well in the sense that you've got the left and right panning, which is usual. But it sounds like there's so much depth to everything that's happening. I don't know if anyone else picked up on that or or felt like there was you know. It was almost like 3D in that way. There was, there was the left and right, but there was also the kind of width in that. And it's not something that's so perceptible in other music, but it was so like obvious here in a lot of places. I think that's kind of helped on by the fact there aren't loads of competing elements. Like, not every gap is filled. Not every frequency is like has something that has to be crammed into it. You know, it's got space. And that space kind of lets the vocal come through a bit and, like you said, adds to, like, a more kind of 3D effect, I suppose. It's just nice to hear something with a bit more space than possibly we're used to these days. The thing I noticed it really on was the guitar especially, because, the guitar, like, the, the, the bass and obviously the drums are very centred and they, they still sound quite wide, but the, the guitar itself didn't really sound left and right to me. It sounded, like, front and back. Just, like, quite an odd experience but uh, yeah i guess like what you're saying is because there's so much space for things to happen which you don't tend to get because everyone's so focused and wrapped up in tiny little incidental bits of music that are happening here or you know i'll just add a pad underneath this or a synth or like 50 cents in my case sometimes um, yeah that kind of thing but it's just something that really stood out to me um when, when listening to this through a couple of times so uh there's been some other reviews um that i think have mentioned this but uh i listened um now we actually decided last thursday we were proper prepared that we would be listening to this album so it wasn't out yet at that point when i was like okay who are dry cleaning um i listened to some of their previous music and um it it does feel a little more sort of eclectic and uh, again a lot of the reviews have pointed out that um you know this album is mixed a lot better which helps um their unique sound come through and helps you focus in on some of these elements uh here and there um i'm not somebody who can critique that really in depth like you guys can um but you know overall do you did you enjoy the 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 production and the sound on the album you know um i'm sure we'll get into it more when we hit the sum up but not a bad point to bring it up yeah absolutely um production value is really great like even when it's kind of trying not to be <laughs> in like some places like the noise the noisier parts are never like uncomfortable they are they manage to do exactly what they set out to do, grab your attention or jar you slightly, but it's not like so uncontrolled that it sounds bad, <laughs> which I think is an easy tri easy trap to fall into. Um, bass is super solid, like throughout, like such a nice bat round, like exactly what a bass should be. Um, and again, with the, like the use of space and how full it does sound for like comparatively few instruments. Um, there are some synth parts in here, like some little pads and things like that coming through. So it was really like focused, they're really tight, they're not a big all consuming pad <laughs> that just fills in every possible gap. Um yeah, I think everything's really focused, really tight. Everything sits exactly where it needs to for me. Um doesn't feel empty even though it's got space. Yeah, I think we we've obviously touched on that space, but Brad's just hit the metal on the head there for me where it it's amazing how controlled an uncontrolled sound like this feels. Do you know what I mean? Where it's like 
you've got these these obscure kind of crazy jarring guitar parts going on um but they like brad said they don't ever feel uncomfortable at any point they feel you know pulled back where they need to be pushed up where they where they need to be and everything just feels right there wasn't ever a point on this record where i was like oh that's too clean or that's too messy or that's too anything it was just all uh, you know it's goldilocks mixing really <laughs> it's just right so i think that probably just about covers off her hippo there uh the titular track track six new long leg brings us a touch more melody i think than some of the other songs on this album um those do do do's are probably about as earworm i think as we get on this record um what have you got down for new long leg brad yeah there's again a lot to like about this um i think you've kind of got some guitar mimicking the vocals here as well you've got like the kind of bends at the beginning kind of mimicking the you are phrase that's kind of prominent in the intro um again it's like a hypnotic intro that kind of trance thing that Cameron's mentioned. Um, the guitar part on this, I just, I love it. <laughs> you know, I really love the guitar part on this one. It's like perfection. Um, and again, like, there's some nice instrumental breaks in this one as well. Like, you've kind of got an A, B, A, B, instrumental C, and then you drop back down to drums and bass again. Um, before the guitar builds back, um, back into that like really good guitar part. <laughs> um, yeah, like some great writing here, it's great structure. Um, I'm gonna have to stop talking about the guitar part, so I'm gonna pass it back over. I think. So I'm gonna immediately talk about the guitar parts <laughs> because <laughs> so good, it's so so good. And the thing that really struck me about this song, and I will say it right off the bat, this is my absolute highlight of this album because you've had I don't know what six songs at this point building this tension, this repetition that you don't even realize is there until you get that release of that chorus, and it is so ridiculously satisfying. I, I I can't think of many other bands that can build attention in a way that you don't even notice is happening. Mm. Um, you, you you haven't even felt tense throughout until you get that release. And you, you know I talk to you all the time about releasing music and building tension, etc. It's just so masterfully done here. It's unreal, honestly. It's is incredible, and it's got another great lyric. You're a spoon pal. You are. You are <laughs> just... a spoon pal. It's just so good, honestly. And again, I don't want to be lazy, like I've said a million times, but it's just got such huge Daydream Nation vibes here, Sonic Youth. Um, but everything about it, it's, it's just a brilliant song. It really is. You know, it's interesting. So I, I was looking back at my notes um, when I uh, when I got scripted out about this track, right? And And I got to the point where I realized that I was writing down a lot of the same bits for each and every track it's like yeah okay here's some more daydreaming poetry here's some more peerless food metaphors that i'm super into and we've had a mention of this in the chat tonight as well about you know lots of food especially ready made being mentioned throughout this album um and you know when i was looking at my notes i, I was wondering you know am i getting bored of this album but then as soon as i'm listening to it it's just like no nah, i never am um, I think that this is down to the music. You know, it remains so diverse throughout with a recognizable sound. I think, um, you know, it, it certainly sounds like dry cleaning. I think when you, you know, you know, past the halfway point in the album here. Um, but, you know, as I say, so diverse and in a perfect accompaniment to the vocals, which honestly i think worse albums could have made sound really repetitive um it's 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 very very well done very well done i actually read a youtube comment and i I'm remiss of me to bring up a youtube comment never read talking, the comments bro but, never read but, the comments well, this one was really good because i it said basically that a lot of bands would have just kind of um you know gone with her on everything she was doing but they kind of go around and fill that space and it, it was a perfect description for what they're doing it, it feels like so cohesive as a unit whereas separately these things shouldn't 
really work that well together at any point. It's intriguing. I don't feel. Yeah, I thought I thought I I I couldn't not like sort of uh go back to that comment because I thought it was such a good sort of sky. I don't know who said it, and I can't shout them out, but um. <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was such a good way of uh, summing up what what everything was happening on here. And you, you're right; it it should be boring, but it's not. It's never boring at all. So you know, this is a debut album here. I mean, you know, this band um, have had some other releases. They've uh, been around for a few years now. Um, I think from my reading, it it was potentially the other way around where um you know she was uh invited by the band who needed a vocalist um at that point i could be totally wrong here i'm sure i read that that it was like they needed somebody so you know she came along she was invited in um but you know again it it, it never feels out of kilter with each other it never feels like you know one lot is just going along with the other lot or anything like that i think you know they they both equally drive each other along um great so john wick is up after this track seven um and i don't know about you guys but i think we finally get to what i came to this album for and that is hot takes on the antiques roadshow cam what's your antiques roadshow hot take is it you know do you agree that having more price reveals actually ruins the suspense of them um do you know what there was a line on this song that I, I just was so drawn to that I actually didn't even know there was an Antiques Roadshow reference on this oh, on dude, this it's song. Like the first... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but on multiple, you gotta remember at this point, I've listened to this album, you know, multiple, multiple times, and there is a line in the middle of this song that I'm sure we'll come to in a minute that you cannot be drawn to and you cannot not discuss. <laughs> it's it's just there so i'm sorry but i don't have an antiques roadshow hot take maybe brad does come on brad help me out help me out <laughs> i feel that the best thing about the uh, price reveals with the suspense and, uh... <laughs> well, there you which go. one is antiques roadshow is that the one is that the one where old people take their stuff and then like they, they think it's really valuable but it never is it's um God, I was trying to think about this when I was writing that down. Um, it's Fiona Bruce. I think you're right. Yeah, you know, it's uh, well. Sorry, I think it's Fiona Bruce. But yes, you are right. Um, is the right way of saying that. Um, it is you know bringing your antiques along, getting them valued, etc. It's not the one where they like give them a hundred pound and go and buy a couple. No, that's, of that's bargain hunt. They... <laughs> that's bargain <Okay>. hunt. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. This is the mastery of this band, right? They've written this great album. And here we are discussing daytime TV shows that are not aimed at our demographic in any way, shape, or form. Like, how can you how can you set out a band and do that? Like, that's just uh, amazing for me. I, I'm just going to take over for a second because I, I, I mentioned interlude. it before. Take us to the interlude. Take us there. Yeah. But the line that stood out to me most on this album and that I relate to the most is that some... <laughs> Someone pissed on my leg in the big Sainsbury's. If you're an Aries, then I'm an Aries. And the only reason I related to it is because somehow, somewhere, it took me straight to the big Sainsbury's in Brighton. <laughs> and not that that ever happened there. Okay. But, but it, I don't know why it just gave me such big, big Sainsbury's in Brighton vibes. Um, and it's a standout line. There's so no way you can <laughs> ignore it. I mean, look, you know, I, I, I'm going to say I've had I've had more affecting moments in little Sainsbury's like those Sainsbury uh, expresses or, or perhaps moments stood outside of little Sainsbury's uh, than I have in big Sainsbury's. So I didn't relate. But I think that there is a great bit of music or, you know, a, a, a great little thing that accompanies those lines, you know, skipping over that astrology reference. The next thing you get is the sound of falling water. And you're just like, oh God, are we listening to piss right now? Um, before In the, the big words, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, before the words raincoat sweat cut through, um, and you know, and, and announced the start of what is quite a wonderful guitar solo at that point. And you go, okay, no, you know, hopefully that was just rain, not pee in a big Sainsbury's. I think this song kind of goes big on the dissonance. And it kind of ties in with that. Like, you've got a really dissonant intro on this. Um, you've got that guitar solo that kind of starts like inside and jumps outside fairly quickly. Um, 
again, more dissonance coming through there. Um, I think as well as the kind of the rain noise, you've got what sounded to me like flies or like a fly buzzing around, yeah. adding to the kind of gross vibe <laughs> of it. Um, just some more noise coming through as well. Um, but yeah, I feel like it all kind of matches that theme of Cameron's most relatable line. <laughs> just, just to, just to take, just to go on another thing that Brad was saying there with the sort of darker tonality and things like that, and going back to something I was saying right at the beginning of this stream about space and not playing every note. I really started to notice on this song as well, other than the Sainsbury's line, that this guitar player is. I really should learn his name. He's some really solid work on this album, but is just so good at not playing every note and only playing when it absolutely needed to. Um, which is Brad will tell you a guitar player's worst nightmare, you know, you wanna hit every note and just go it's just constantly be in the face of everyone. But he's so good at being quite spare with everything he's doing. Um, but in a big way. It, it's it's a really hard way to it's kind of hard thing to describe what he's doing. Um but it's just something that really stood out to me at that point. Yeah, it's not overplayed, but it's like perfectly enough and you know, the bits where it does go into kind of outside territory tonality wise, um it feels like it has purpose as well. It's not like it's considered, it's not like random it's not like, oh, this guy's not playing in key accidentally. It's everything's really considered. Um and it's... It all, it's yeah, it's also um it's not just that it's just considered but it also retains that improv feel which i think is a really difficult thing to do mm. it's you know to be considered but to still sound like you're kind of improv jamming over the top of the track is i can't do it very well i don't know i can't speak for you but i think that's a really difficult thing to achieve um from from, from a guitar playing point of view yeah definitely um it's a band that i think I really want to see live just for that exact mm -hmm. reason. Mm -hmm. You know, I might be jumping the gun on that a bit, but it's one of the bands that, like, I think there are so many standout moments that you think this would work really well live. No, no. With, like, the hypnotic kind of vibe and that kind of, like you say, like, possibly half improvised guitar stuff. I think it's a must see. I, I, I'm ready to have a Thurston Moore moment with this band. Um, that's for sure. Uh, absolutely no doubt that that is exactly what it will be. It will be, you will be lost talking to God on Jupiter or, you know, to quote sleep, being chased by a dragon under vast red sky, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something huge. So uh, let's move on to more big birds. Uh, Cam, do you want to lead us off? Yeah, this this a very odd intro to me, but it works. It kind of sounded like so you've got that drum pattern, and you've got the bass, um, and it sounds like with the vocals coming in, like three different songs have started at once. Um, not in a bad way, but it just it didn't feel like one song. I was like, well, this is really quite an unusual. Um, I certainly hadn't heard anything like that before um, until I later got shown a. Um, song that was quite similar but yeah it was it's so unusual but then the guitar comes in and it just ties it all together so perfectly be like oh okay this is how it all clues together and i thought it was a really unusual way to start a song um it's it's so strange to hear and even sort of just more impressed that they were able to pull off something like that to be honest with you because i know if i tried that they would just sound like complete mess so just on that no, please, Sorry, Matt. please go ahead. Just on, just on the intro, the thing it really reminded me of, and I was like quite taken aback to notice myself thinking about this was "Come Together" by the Beatles. The intro to that, um, you've got that Tom feel. It kind of feels like it's, it's obviously a more out there version. Um, kind of feels like parts of it are reversed. It's a bit backwards, but that's what I was like. I was not expected, not was not expecting to be so heavily reminded of the Beatles in this track. Yeah, and that was that was the song I kind of thought of um, much later. Um, was come together, but 
again i also feel about that song that it, for me it doesn't sound like the same song until it really kicks in um I, d I don't know what it is but it just sounds like separate things are happening it works obviously but it's it's just such a kind of brave way to start a song i think anyway so i think i i I picked up something different, right? You know, and I, I'm still learning a lot about vocal production, but it stood out a lot to me at the start of more big birds. Um, you know, she's, she's doubled up. Um, she's huge. And I, I thought it was kind of putting the shoe on the other foot um, uh, where, you know, sometimes the music's really drawing you in there. Um, but, you know, she was very much uh, drawing me into the intro um, uh, helped out with that vocal production there. Um, the keys uh, that came through kind of uh, after the chorus and that were following the guitar along were very pr uh, pleasant. Um, and I think we get a lot of focus on keys and synth in this track. Um, I hadn't picked it up really in other places. I mean, you guys have already spoken tonight, um, I think, about uh, you know some places where since uh do start to show up but you know this was for me sort of the track where you know i heard it more than on any other uh songs uh that i could remember there um it, it does give a different dynamic um i will say overall i i i can't say that more big birds is probably my favorite song on the this album but you know it, it's certainly not unpleasant by any stretch of the imagination It's no, more I can't. Of a relaxed, oh, sorry, Brad. <laughs> sorry. It's more of a relaxed vibe again, I think, this one. Um, like you say, some key parts, some nice key parts coming through. I think it's like a distorted kind of phased organ, like coming out a bit in the, the latter parts of this song. Um, just harmonically as well on this, there's like a lot of kind of focus on the ninth. Um, there's like a big E minor nine section where it goes between like E minor nine and D, and it's got that kind of ninth note running through it which is kind of ear catching on this one uh sorry what are you gonna say cam no i was just gonna say sort of kind of more again what was said earlier is that it it feels like such a fresh take on a genre that's quite old now and it's quite a difficult thing to do i find um but it's still got all the right elements it's still doing everything that everyone else in the genre is doing vocals aside because obviously they're quite quite different um you know you, you you'd get vibes of what you get vibes of the murder capital of even at some point it's porridge radio just with that deadpan delivery um but it feels so fresh and this song felt like such a fresh composition um you know like just just, just so um masterfully written and so again i keep going back to this it feels like a jam band but they feel like a very very considered jam band mm. which is, is just unusual great so uh moving on to alc um all of the focus is very much uh i think back on the guitar at the start of uh, alc you know um it's interesting brad i think you said you know that last song's a little bit slower this was the one that really struck me as you know one being one of the um uh you know the particularly slower songs on the album there um but uh what are you feeling about alc again it's like a really kind of dissonant like filthy intro <laughs> um just the guitar and bass i think there's some really cool effects going on in this which just kind of like sum up to make it like slightly unnerving <laughs> in places um like the hats i don't know if i don't know if anyone else has noticed this in the album anywhere else but it was certainly the first time it really caught my ear We've got like hats, some delays on those like panned hard left. You've got like a really weird kind of vocal effect panned hard right coming out. But it's just like slightly creepy and unsettling. Um, and then obviously it's just like, I think it's a bit more atmospheric, this track, um, until you're back into the kind of filth again, <laughs> which it just kind of unceremoniously drops you back into. <laughs> Yeah, there's that weird delay on the guitar as well, isn't there? And it, it kind of almost sounds out of tune. Um, it, it very much builds into that dissonance, but it never sounds unpleasant. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I couldn't really hear by ear if they were using some sort of weird tuning here, but it kind of felt like one of those strange kind of tunings were maybe being used, and that delay really added to that atmosphere in it. 
um it, it wasn't so much actually the instruments that caught my ear here it was the vocals again because as much as we've been saying they're deadpan there's there's some real venom delivered on on some of the words here where you wouldn't expect in places that you just why why is that such an angry word like uh you know hendon which is a place in london and i can't think of anything particularly wrong with it i don't think i've ever been there but still um, <laughs> there's just such venom delivered with that line that you're like well what what happened in hendon and then you kind of start to try and build this picture again around what happened in hendon or you know you can't just come into my garden in your football kit just you know some real anger coming through on this part but never really told why um which is which is interesting as somebody who, you know, in my time living in London, I lived uh, about five minutes away from Hendon. I, I totally get it. That's 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 all I'll say there. Um, yeah, you know, it's really interesting, I think, how the vocals are kind of maybe not evolving, but devolving um, uh, throughout this track. You know, you've got those long, drawn-out thoughts about cafe and hendon sushi bar salad bar you know things like that um before you move into some shorter sh um sharp jabs of lines throughout the rest of the song um a lonely job for 32 pounds a day uh you foil beast um i think we've had all of these you know types of days before that i think she's describing throughout this and do end up you know finishing those days in the same way that the song finishes off saying talk to me in the bath just just talk to me in the bath that's that's all i want right now so um yeah it, it's it, it, there is there is some clear emotion um being delivered here and you combine that with the kind of haunting instrumentation uh, and it really comes through as this this is the angry song on the album this is the the aggression coming out at this point um and it all just, again, works so subtly to shift towards that. And it almost, again, is imperceptible until you really, really listen deeply to that. Because otherwise it would just feel like more of the same. And I think you kind of really, at this point, understanding why it never gets boring. Because there's these little tiny shifts from song to song. Um, it was something, I think, that struck me about the guitar in the intro, right? You know, it... it, it whatever melody is going there it, it remains unresolved at some point it feels like it cuts short um and you know doesn't then resolve itself i think throughout the rest of the track there so you know again uh, another method of building up some tension um uh, that helps deliver on that promise yeah it's more dissonance isn't it and like cam said with the venom kind of delivered on the vocals it it's a good match here um does anyone actually know what ALC stands for? I meant to try and look up common acronyms of ALC yeah. before we got on here, but I did not do that. Did not do can that. We can we have <laughs> guesses in the comments? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it might have been one of those, uh, what is it, locked in syndrome or, or Lou Gehrig, something, something along those I'd lines. ALS. ALS. Yeah, ALS, isn't it? So I, I didn't know it was trying to like bring up some sort of connotation of that but no i have no idea what alc means it might not mean anything you know this, this is what this album's so good at is you know delivering you a line that you're sure is insightful and full of thought and you know i go back to you can't just come into my garden in your football kit like what does that actually mean how do you unpack that how do you even begin to unpack that is that a real event that happened is that you know, it's, it's so personal, but so abstract at the same time. How how do you even begin? So ALC might mean something really common, because I'm sure Matt's looking it up now, but <laughs> it also just might mean absolutely nothing to anyone but uh, the, the vocalist. Um, so uh, I will say, because you started talking about ALS, I did type in ALCS initially, and I know what that stands for, that's for sure. Um, ALC from, uh, according to Wikipedia, ALC is a Los Angeles based women's ready to wear fashion brand founded in 2009 by Andrea Lieberman. Um, there's some other mentions on Google as well to, um, it being a Harvey Nichols, uh, or a brand that's, yeah, a brand that's stocked in Harvey Nichols and things. So clothing, jeans, clothing, there's a lot of clothing being mentioned. Do they make football so. kits? <laughs> not as far as i'm aware <laughs> not as far as i'm aware because that would be the connection 
I like that. I like that connection. Man. I know, that's, that's a good one. They're probably, if they ever watch this, though, wow, those guys are way off. <laughs> I, I, I didn't think of that throughout. I think if any band, we, we discussed this last week with Citizen, right? If any band listens to what we're saying, it's like, they totally missed the fucking point. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this one more than more so than possibly any other thing we'll ever listen to. I think we got Slope Bang on, but I'll leave it there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, you know, just to stop us, I guess, from making too many more mistakes, we can get on to the closing track on the album. That's Everyday Carry. And, you know, um, I mentioned the food imagery earlier. This is Water mentioned the food imagery in the chat as well. And who boy, do we get a lot of it here on the closer um, from chocolate chip cookies to crappy, crazy pizzas, individual cream buns and a banging past the bank. Um, it, it, it's it's a wonderful way i think to close out this album what do you guys uh feel uh I, absolutely stunning ending to the album we've complained for the last few weeks that albums haven't been ending with a flourish haven't been having this huge sort of crescendo when they've spent a really long time building up to it and this album does not at any point build up to this or promise that it's gonna give you this Oh boy, do they do it. it! Just it builds, and it's—I almost couldn't even really tell how it was building. It just felt like it was getting more and louder, but it—I it, don't know how. And it just like, built up this intensity to this crazy breakdown where they've got all this, you know, wild guitar playing. Ala Thurston, one of the lazy reference to Sonic Youth, but um, you know that—that it's—it's unmistakable. You know, you can almost, you know, hit your guitar strings with screwdrivers and do that kind of thing. That was what sounded like was going on. Um, and you're just in such a trance and then it's just into that huge ending and then you're back to reality um, it's just such a great way to end what has been an absolute wild ride of an album uh just very quickly uh hey dreadlocks triple seven thanks again for joining us in chat this week uh he chimes in with alc is short for uh alchemist the hip-hop producer but i doubt he's a strong influence here haha <laughs> Shout out Alchemist made some great records over the years. <laughs> it could be right. You never know. It might no. be an influence. No. We were talking earlier about strand strands of uh, influence and how they connect. So there's, there's absolutely every chance Alchemist influenced this. No doubt. No doubt. Um, yeah, you know, I I I fell. Um, I, I wrote down in the uh, in my notes, you know, we didn't get an adequate closer last week, um, but this delivered more than enough for two weeks. Uh, we 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 leveled that back out there. Um, it, it's the first place where I was really clearly able to write down the Sonic Youth vibes. I'm I'm a little less um, familiar with them, but you know, if you had told me that it was a a thirst and more composition, you're particularly that um, two minute long instrumental interlude. I, I wouldn't be surprised. You've got, you know, the unique and at times bizarre noises that just sneak up on you out of nowhere to just like, oh, cool, just here's like a one bar solo um, to, you know, that slow building wall of noise that drops in and out. Um, and then you kick straight back into overdrive. Um, I, 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 I love it. Um, the vocal delivery remains divine alongside an array of just so pleasing noise so pleasing noise there's a point where you think like it's the noise where this is gonna end like this is a long long song <laughs> so i think we're like pushing the seven and a half minute territory here easily but it doesn't feel like it um you've got builds that feel like long and hypnotic you just get lost in them um like you said like weird bits of noise like crashing through just like screaming for your attention and then disappearing again <clears throat> a what sounds like a flute solo that then turns into a guitar solo <laughs> um, yeah I was, then... I was actually going to say that it, there's just instruments flying in that you haven't heard yet on this album like the flute like there's yeah. a, no point that they hint oh we're gonna do a ripping flute solo as uh, yeah. a la Joni Mitchell, but here it is. <laughs> I finally I think got that. she directly that. mentions this flute. I think she directly mentions flute, and then you're into flute solo, and then you're like back in guitar land, and it's like, well, where have I just been? Um, but yeah, to like go from that like long hypnotic 
section straight back into like the best parts of what we're used to, like the driving bass, the pounding drums, and then for it to just end. <laughs> It is like you you are just like then stood there in Sainsbury's realizing how bright the lights are and like oh how god I have to be normal your... again. And and how much piss is on your leg as well, right? Um Yeah, exactly. Uh yeah, um it 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 does fool you a little bit. Um and I, I love a song that fools you into thinking that it's going down one path, but you hit that um interlude and you think okay yeah no this is just gonna drone out close i look you know i've got four minutes left of this song here um uh, but uh, if if you disappear during that you miss out on again just another section of just strong imagery i think everything that we've mentioned here tonight the food you know some of the um uh some of the relationship stuff you know things like that it all comes in just two paragraphs of just stream of consciousness um and it's it's delivered so well um to that just boom boom close boom that's it you're out you're done um it's it's fantastic and there you go yeah you know so we got our strong closer from last week we got the flute which you know we were missing on lana del rey's um uh uh joni mitchell cover um, so dry cleaning have done a fantastic job of just making up for everything that I've been missing out on over the last two weeks. Um, I really like it. And, you know, I think if it's good for you guys, uh, we can transition over to the um, sum up discussion, I think, at this point. And I, I, I think it's pretty clear where I'm falling down on this um, album. But, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, I wasn't entirely sure what to make of it when I first sat down and started listening to a bit of dry cleaning um first listen it was like okay um this is this is different but the one thing i knew was that i had had fun listening to that whatever it is um each subsequent listen just grew that feeling and and confirmed what i'd hoped which is that i i really like new long leg yeah i think it's quite shocking like how this can kind of feel like two different albums <laughs> if you the first time i listened to it it was kind of like right i've got some stuff to do i'm gonna put it on in the background and just let it play through and there's still like a lot to liking there i think you do get drawn to the vocals a lot more and like those kind of bits stick out but then when you kind of actually sit down to properly listen to it like all these other things start coming out of the woodwork that you didn't really realize were there and um i think i could listen to this album another four or five times and find new things to like about it you know i don't think it's going to be something that's going to get boring um but yeah like on the first listen it was definitely a completely different experience to like an actual okay let's listen to this now properly yeah, I think it'll come as no surprise to both of you that I absolutely adored this album. Uh, so much so that I'm probably, spoiler alert, but going to buy it. Um, it's, it's right in my wheelhouse. Like I said, this is, this is a genre I absolutely love um, and have done for a long time um, and keep trying to send to you, Matt. <laughs> <over the years. laughs> um, and, and now that I know Brad enjoys it, be prepared for a lot more recommendations there's there's been a lot of a lot of post-punk come out lately especially from the uk i mean you can even throw in a band like idols um although they're a little bit different you can even throw that into there you know there's the murder capital um across the pond you've got all this band's right up there for me is the best in the genre right now um uh, as close i i went to see what a few years ago and i described this trance like feeling I'd never heard of them at the time, but immediately I was just in that zone. And this album somehow recaptured that live feeling for me, where from first listen, I don't think I got the different experiences you guys got, but I immediately was just zoned into that other plane of existence that you can only get to with music like this. Um, and it's just it's just absolutely amazing from start to finish. <laughs> I wholeheartedly understand that, right? I, I had to stop myself because, you know, again, it's like I need to be coherent about this when we get to the stream. And, you know, you guys can tell me whether I've ended up being coherent or not. I, I, I'm not sure if that's something that I'm coherent anyway. But 
um, you know, it was it was merely the fact that I was sitting down and I was having to take notes on this throughout that I was like, OK, um, you know, if I wasn't doing this, I would have just sunk into it. It was that same thing. I want to be sitting down on a nice comfy carpet or something with this album on in the background. And it, it I, I keep coming back to it. I mentioned it on the track by track, but um, I, I just think it's so perfectly crafted. Um, you know, the vocals and the instruments work in perfect harmony to keep you engaged. When I think given their styles, you know, one of the other in isolation could take you down a very, very different path. Um, I spoke, of, you know, just very briefly about the production, how there is a noticeable step up, I think, from uh, some of their other work. Um, there was nothing on this album. And I, I said last week, you know, I'm not at the point where I can pick out good production. I can pick out bad production, but nothing ever came through and broke that spell for me, um, which is just so wonderful because I, I can focus on the peerless imagery and metaphor that we're presented with. Um, I, I, I have nothing in my rotation that's like this right um and in all honesty i am so glad that this is the record that i can add to my rotation to fill that void um it's not going on when i'm driving or anything like that but god is it something that is going to go on uh when i need to unwind um no doubt about it uh, how, how about you guys i mean you know cam you said you're buying it i i assume that means that's is is it in your rotation uh, it's a hundred percent and not only in my rotation but i wholeheartedly disagree that you can't drive to this album this is a perfect driving album <laughs> that that bass all throughout just is made for driving to um I, I i i've spoken a lot of lot on previous weeks about time and a place you know this this has a time and a, this album just comes on any time for me it's it's straight <laughs> into regular rotation i think this is one of the i i listened to the slope album a few times after we'd uh obviously done the discussion on it and i think uh maybe the lana del rey one i've listened to once since we did the discussion on it i'm probably going to get off this stream and go listen to this record again <laughs> i loved it that much brad how about that's you? exactly yeah. yeah that's exactly what i was going to say considering i've listened to this album like five times in three days i could probably go and listen to it again right now <laughs> and find something and again find something different and find something else to like about it well, there you have it, folks. I think that's pretty unanimous. Pretty unanimous right there. Um, let's try and look ahead to next week. And I'm going to say right now, we probably, I mean, you know, we've been live for an hour 45 right now. I'm sure we could drag another hour and 45 out of this album, but we should probably, for the format, listen to another album for next week. Um, have, have we got any ideas what we're going for? I'm going for dry cleaning. Let's do it again. <laughs> um, yeah, I, oh, I've forgotten the name of it, but there's a Portuguese artist with an album out next week that I thought sounded quite interesting. Um, you know, as we are all post genre e type people and don't like to be confined, I thought that might be a challenge for us to try and unlock, unlock a, an album in a completely different language in a style that I'd never heard of until I read the Wikipedia page of it. I think it's called Fado. Fado sounds about right. Um, yeah, I can't remember the artist's name. Is it Zhao Gisela? Uh, you're, I, I, I'm a boy who grew up in Wisconsin, right? You're, you're getting very fancy <laughs> for me right now. Um, no, uh, I, I, I read through the Wikipedia. Um, it's apparently it's a type of uh, music that is, uh, you know, it, it's very rigid in the type of style that it needs to be, right? You know, very melancholy and about heartbreak or. Was it even like losing things at sea or something like that? Always has to be um, a, a lyrical concept that you deal with. Um, so, yeah. yeah, my Portuguese isn't great. Uh, my English isn't great, but it's about the only language I can speak. I, I'm, I'm more than up for giving it a go. Yeah, some crash courses in Portuguese before <laughs> next week. <laughs> How much do you reckon Google Translate will take away from the impact of the lyrics? <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping it's one of those like Shakira where she's got a uh, you know Spanish version or I'm sorry in this case Portuguese version and an uh, English version so I can at least understand what's going on but you know we can we can dissect the music it, it'll be it'll be a ride for all three of us I expect because I'm not sure I don't know if you'd ever come across any Vado before Brad no. <laughs> yeah so this should this should be a fun one you never know we, we anger some Portuguese people with our butchering of their you know prominent musical genre 
I, I'm looking forward to it. I really am. I think that's going to be a good bit of fun. And uh, I tell you what, guys, as we start to wrap up here, um, I want to thank everybody for joining us along on this journey tonight, talking about Dry Cleaning's new album, New Long Leg. Uh, if you want to see us uh, dealing with uh, Portuguese music next week, please do tune in. We'll be going live at the same time next week. Uh, if you've missed any of our discussion tonight or you want to hear all of it again, uh, we will have a recorded version of this going up on our YouTube channel on Sunday. And if you are watching that recorded version, then, as I say, we'll be going live again next Friday at 8 p.m. GMT with another album review. Uh, shout out again to Millie Draws A Lot on Instagram. That's spelt with a Y for all of our wonderful graphics. Uh, if you want more dry cleaning, then head on over to their Bandcamp. Uh, I believe that was just drycleaning.bandcamp.com. Uh, and if you want more ballpark music, then check out our link tree. That's slash ballpark music UK, where you can find all of our socials. Uh, Brad, it's been great to have you aboard again. Uh, you enjoy tonight's discussion? I did, yeah. Almost as much as I enjoyed that guitar part, but I really can't keep talking about it, so... We're going to go off stream and he's going to play it for us, just like he did with the guitar part that he enjoyed last week on the Citizen album. Cam, thank you very much once again. You enjoy it? Yeah, man. Loved it. Loved right. it every week. Every week's a new uh, new adventure in that. So. I tell you what, I have had a lot of fun tonight. Uh, that's it from us, folks. We'll see you all next time. Take care and stay safe.